Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Breakouts, a podcast where we interview extraordinary founders in just under 20 minutes. I'm your host, Akshay Kosla. Now, you'll find many podcasts out there that are two to three hours long and interview these wildly successful founders after they've already made it big. But by that point, the founders are already 5, 10, or even 15 years into their journey, so their insights just aren't as actionable anymore. We're doing things a little bit different. We're interviewing founders that are on the cusp of breaking out so that you can learn the playbooks they're using to build category-defining companies today. And we're doing it in just under 20 minutes. Now, just before we get started, go ahead and follow us on Twitter at The Breakouts Pod, subscribe to this YouTube channel, and join our Discord community for aspiring founders. The link is in the description below. A real quick disclaimer right before we get started. This episode is one of the first few we recorded, so the audio and video quality isn't that great. We're working to improve it so that we can deliver a better podcast experience for you guys. But regardless, the insights in this episode and the entrepreneur that we interviewed are amazing. So definitely still go ahead and give it a listen. And I think that's everything I have for you. So without further ado, here's today's guest. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Breakouts. We have an awesome guest for you today who recently raised a $3 million pre-seed in the Web3 space. It's my pleasure to welcome Season Lee, the co-founder and CEO of Ramper. Season, how are you doing today? Uh, Good. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We're going to be doing two episodes together. And this first episode is going to be all about the story behind your startup. So we're going to talk a little bit about how your startup came about, how it works, and how you think about winning the industry. So to get us started off, in just a few sentences, could you tell us what your startup does and what problem you guys are trying to solve? Yeah, sure. So Ramper is a middleware provider for dApps, so decentralized applications out there. Uh, what we do is we provide solutions that make it easy for them to onboard uh, new to crypto users. So folks that don't understand crypto, don't have wallets, may not have cryptocurrencies. And so we provide solutions like Ramper Connect, which is our embedded MPC wallet. Uh, so you don't have to download anything. You can just get started. Uh, we have our own fiat on ramp NFT checkout, which means you can make transactions using debit card and credit cards. Um, so that's what we do at Ramper. Very cool. I love the theme around on ramping more users to crypto. We're definitely gonna dive deeper here. Right before we talk more about your product, could you share a little bit about your personal background and what kind of led you into this journey of building a startup? Yeah, so uh, I'm a Korean Canadian founder. Um, I moved to the States when I was 10 and I've I've, I've been a PM um, before going into entrepreneurship. So a product manager at Facebook, spent some time at Uber and Tesla. Uh, This is my second company. Um, after my first company, um, it was actually uh, a beverage company out of all things. So that was wow. a side project that sort of uh, spun its way into becoming a business. I left the tech world, did that for three years. But after raising Series B, um, I wanted to go back into the tech world. So we hired a CEO. I stepped down. Um, I'm still a board member, but I wanted to um, sort of investigate and figure out what is it that I wanted to do. And I think crypto just, you know, it was such a weird um, and massive rabbit hole where a lot of my previous coworkers that I thought were very brilliant, that I respected, uh, were all spending time there. And so I guess I also fell into the rabbit hole. Um, and, you know, after a couple of months of tinkering, I decided to do this full time. That's so cool. I'm curious about your last company. What kind of beverage did you make? Yeah, so it started out as like a nootropics sort of direct to consumer side project. Um, so we, our first product, product was called Morning Recovery, which which is sort of like a Um, science back hangover prevention type of drink, which is actually very famous in the Eastern person world, like Korea and Japan. It just turned out that it wasn't very popular in the United States. Um, Then it turned into sort of actually building our own brand, um, us raising actually 8 million of sort of Series A and turning into a whole brand. Um, And that transitioned into a a, um, a parent brand called More Labs. And, you know, right now we're in over probably closer to 100,000 stores nationwide. Um, And now it's a series of different nootropics, um, types of beverages, you know, very functional, um, biohacking, that type of stuff, but for sort of everyday usage. Um, yeah. So I think that's like a whole, whole other story. Um, definitely, uh, was very serendipitous, but that was a very, very exciting journey, but definitely wanted to come back to tech. 
Very cool. It seems like you have a very multifaceted skill set and background. Diving back into Ramper, so I see on your website you guys branded as a free Web3 SDK for auth, wallet, and crypto slash NFT purchases. Could you talk to me a little bit more about the key use cases here? When we think about Web3 SDKs and APIs, people will also think of competitors like Alchemy, for example. So could you talk about what differentiates you here and then maybe walk us through a use case of someone that initially discovers your website and then goes on to realize value from it? Yeah, so prior to building Ramper, um, I actually joined as an entrepreneur in residence at Hashed, uh, which is a, you know, um, crypto VC out in, out in Seoul. And my, my first sort of um, stepping stone into crypto was, uh, it was just very hard for me to actually use anything um, as, as a user. Um, it was kind of surprising because I thought I was probably much more tech savvy than average user. And yet understanding how uh, keys work or getting wallets and all of that was a very, very big pain point. Um, and because I come from the consumer world, uh, my initial knee jerk reaction was I wanted to build like an application that people could use on, on blockchain. And so when you combine the two, it just seemed like no matter what type of consumer application you build, regardless of the vertical, the friction just seemed like it was way too high. Um, and so even though we didn't quite understand exactly what the solution is or what the right go to market is, generally spending time figuring out how to make it easier, uh, seemed like it was like a worthy problem to start solving. And so specific use cases here is, uh, well, the big elephant in the room is there aren't many like large consumer applications in Web3 today, right? So basically, we definitely kind of thought of this as this is probably what will get really big very quickly, which is, um, you know, at the very early days, there's a lot of infrastructures and protocols, and there are some uh, really niche uh, but engaging use cases like DeFi uh, and different NFTs marketplaces, but probably there will be many more um, you know, everyday usages, whether it's entertainment, uh, media, utility, social. And when these things come, uh, we should probably ride the wave of them um, and make it really easy for people to onboard. So, you know, we have a customer, so we're a B2B provider, and one of our clients that uh, we're very fascinated with is actually a very large um, K-pop agency in Korea who wanted to build sort of like a DAO model uh, into their uh, mobile application. So to elaborate more, um, just like any sort of like a K-pop group, it, it, it's, it's a group that, uh, you know, releases music, albums, and et cetera but they wanted to build an application in which fans can come in and they can essentially govern. So what they do is things like you could purchase NFTs that represent individual members, and then you can use them as a token of governance to direct the careers of these um, groups, essentially, like what album should they release? Where should they perform? Um, and they wanted to do all of that on blockchain. Now, the, the big friction here is like trying to convince K-pop fans to figure out what MetaMask is and how that works and transacting currency is probably <laughs> not going to work. And right. So that's where we come in. So our fans, so their fans actually don't even know that this is being crypto or blockchain underneath, but that's what we enable, which is you can go and download an application. You can sign up using um, things like Google or Facebook. So it just looks like a regular application of Web2. But behind the scenes, what's actually happening is that you're getting a non, non custody of your wallet. And when you buy these NFTs, why it looks like just every other digital collectibles, what's actually happening is that you're actually purchasing NFTs. And so over time, hopefully, um, you know, they can get educated and realize that oh, I have digital ownership, I can probably sell this outside of this application, but the entry point is one where it's very seamless. Um, and that's like that across all, all of our use cases, which is applications that are trying to onboard the mass audience uh, with blockchain beneath the hood. Very cool. And I'm looking at your website right now, and it seems like you guys have launched two key use cases so far. The first being Ramper Connect Web3 login for users without a wallet. And the second being Ramper NFT checkout, fast NFT checkout supporting both crypto and fiat. That's really interesting. I definitely have friends who've tried to build mobile applications in the Web3 space, and they can speak to the amount of problems that you face while trying to build that initial experience for users, especially users that might not be crypto natives, used to storing their own secret keys or backing up in another service. So I, I definitely see the pain point here. I'm curious, it, it looks like you're focused on providing SDKs to developers to help onboard users for Web3 apps. In the future, do you think it would be reasonable to expand into use cases along the full value chain within a product? So not just onboarding and authentication, maybe things like exchanging tokens within an application. 
and so on and so forth? Um, I think high level answer is yes. You know, when we started Ramper, um, and it's, it's still holds true today, which is we don't have a per perfect picture of sort of like, um, you know, where Web3 is even directed, right? I, I think that's one of the fascinating thing with this is that it's such an early stage of Lego blocks that no one actually quite understands with clarity. Mm -hmm. um, we, we picked this because we thought it was a very clear, obvious problem for us to expand from. Uh, and so as we work with these customers, so for, for instance, we started with the authentication layer first, and it's only when working with these customers that we realized that they needed a solution to sell NFTs because a lot of these consumer focused applications um, all have some sort of IP that's wrapped around NFTs that they want to, they want to sell. Um, so that was never part of our solution at the beginning, but uh, we, we had to build it because there was a lot of consumer demand or in our case, um, like business demand. Um, so in, in similar um, context, um, can we uh, expand red horizontally or vertically based on what, what dApps need? Absolutely. Um, so I think the answer is yes, but it's still, we're learning as we go. Very cool. I see on your website that, hey, you guys are free for dApps. You guys are <laughs> secure and scalable. And then you talk about an interoperable wallet solution. You guys have one wallet per user across an infinite number of dApps. Does that mean that, let's say if I was a developer using your product, if I coded a wallet into my application powered by your SDK, then in the future, let's say someone onboards to another person's dApp, they would not have to re-sign up and reset up a wallet because that underlying ramper wallet would still be usable, kind of similar to MetaMask. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, even though we're providing an SDK, we wanted to stay away from a white labeling model in which as users on ramp to different um, dApps, it would essentially create a... Um, sort of wall garden of multiple different wallets, because I think that it would be, it would actually defeat the purpose. Um, and so the way it's interoperable is simply if you're, if multiple dApps use Ramper SDK, of course, then it's the same wallet, but also we have Wallet Connect uh, um, enabled and we plan to release our own sort of interface standalone wallet. And so in a way it's the same thing as, as long as uh, regardless of where the user has been acquired through a dApp being partnered with us, or them going to our own wallet, it'll just work like MetaMask in a sense that it's just one wallet per user uh, that's tied to their identity so that, um, yeah, you don't have to um, create multiple wallets for every single use cases. Very cool. Is it correct to say that one way to think about what you're doing is that mm -hmm. really you're building the first consumer friendly wallet that can be used across dApps, especially on mobile? Um, and the API angle here or being developer first is really your wedge into the industry. Yeah, I think that's very accurate. We, we saw ourselves as, um, I mean, ultimately if you, if, if you, have, if you actually ask like, what is a wallet? Um, it's actually not even like an actual like interface, right? It's just like a pair of private and public keys. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we do definitely think of us as um, hopefully one day. Um, having lots of users using us just so that we can compete with the likes of MetaMask or whatnot. But instead of, you know, tackling that, that angle directly to acquire customers, you know, to come into wallet first, um, we're working with developers providing this for free. So essentially as they grow, as they onboard new users, um, that's our wedge into acquiring users more efficiently. Yeah. Very cool. Who would you say your competitors are? Would you consider MetaMask a competitor or are there any other key competitors that you think about? Uh, it, there are tons, uh, you know, I think the, one of the big elephants in the room is, you know, when we went, built our MVP and we went to like a large crypto conference to, you know, sell and acquire and just like learn, learn from the industry. Um, I would say like 99% are dev tools or infrastructure or middleware, just like us <laughs> looking for applications. And so right. definitely really, really early. Right. Um, hmm. so in that sense, um, there are so many companies trying to do similar things, but tackling in different ways. And so, um, there are direct competitors who are doing the authentication layer wallets. Um, obviously, with the fiat on ramp and NFT, there's tons um, in different areas and adjacency that we want to get into as well. So um, certainly crowded, um, but I think considering sort of where the market will be and hopefully uh, the real use cases of DApps, you know, you know, you know, spiraling. Um, yeah, I, maybe as as we'll see, like uh, more and more differentiation um, along that lines. 
Interesting. So given that the market is f- fairly competitive, I guess you have different competitors on different parts of your product. Some wallet apps will be competitors such as MetaMask. And then there's also the dev tool side of it. For example, Alchemy might be a competitor on your SDK feature set, right? So given there's so many competitors out there, how do you think about winning the market? Um, yeah, I mean, twofold. One naive sort of rationale when we got into this is, um, we needed a starting point um, and having a strong team that builds very quickly uh, and working very rapidly, we just thought like, that's, that's, that's very important because as an EIR, I actually spent four months trying to build a web three company similar to web two, which is like, you know, let's see where the large market is, where the problem exists and let's go solve it. In a way it's actually like very deductible because it's logical. I, I don't think that's actually possible with web three because like nobody really knows. Um, Mm -hmm. And so in one way you have to build momentum. And so that was one thing that was like our knife thing of, you know what, like we have immediate customers. This is clearly a problem. Yes, there are a lot of competitors, but let's start. Um, The second thing is, as we're learning today, I think a lot of it is actually just go to market strategy. Um, And because there are not actually that many dApps, in fact, I would say there are no dApps with product market fit, um, although it's like semantics of how you define it, but there are certainly no application that has probably over a million DAUs today, which in the world of Web2 is actually extremely small, right? If you think there's like 7 million monthly active internet users or something close. Um, so we actually focus more on web two companies that already have really large existing set of user bases um, that are trying to get on chain. And so this K-pop agency is like a perfect example, right? Which is you guys are big, um, you're obviously don't do anything with crypto, but you have an interest and you want to get in here, but you don't want to do it in a way where you're going to jump all over, like fully where the burden is too high for your customers. So. We tend to partner with these type of companies. So another set of customers are like, um, you know, large um, Web2 uh, gaming companies on mobile that wanted to get into this field. Um, that doesn't mean we would exclude ourselves from working with Web3 native companies, mm. but I think um, we're definitely seeing more bet on saying, it's probably going to take a lot of these Web2 companies with existing customers to come in here and help sort of pull that bar um, you know, uh, before like there's like a major Web3 native company uh, that comes in here and helps onboard lots and lots of users. Um, so that's our, our focus of um, go to market. Very cool. I think this is a perfect segue into talking about how you think about your competitive advantage. If you were to summarize yourself, maybe just in one to two points, what's your competitive advantage or, you know, remote in this market? Yeah, I mean, I think the go to market is one of them. Us focusing and partnering with large Web2 companies, definitely one. Uh, mm-hmm. Although we haven't proven anything, right? We haven't won. And so um, I wouldn't say like it's an advantage. It's, it's a hypothesis uh, that we, we, we strongly believe right now. Um, second thing is, I think we have to do um, a full suite of uh, end-to-end user onboarding. Um, you know, like from a customer's perspective, um, if the first step is to get a wallet and you solve that, that might seem good. But like once you come in here and the next step is to make a transaction and you don't know what transactions even are and why they're at gas price, um, you're still equally confused. And so, um, which is what led us to work on Fiat on Ramp and NFT Checkout. And I think all of this has to be seamlessly tied together. As a developer, even though there are discrete solutions, if you enable, enable all of them because they don't actually talk to one another, it's almost like you're doing KYC every single time. And so from a customer's perspective, I came here to use this application and now I need to go through three additional steps just to like use this thing. Mm. So I think part of it is also us rapidly making sure that we have this like full suite of experience, which means we can't solve every single verticals out there, but certainly, um, you know, comp- like with specifically games, um, or, or NFT related type of, um, entertainment or marketplaces, uh, we feel like, Hey, we're a one-stop shop where really for all of your core use cases of getting users and engaging with them, you can use us and like, it's, it's pure, it's very seamless. Um, But we're still not all the way there yet, right? There's probably a lot of other features that we have to, you know, figure out and work on. But Mm. I think it's at those two. It's a holistic onboarding suite of uh, selection, which means speed of execution is very critical. Um, And working with large Web2 companies, uh, which I actually think fundamentally the numbers are pretty staggering, which is you could probably onboard five of the biggest dApps today, which is a very, very hard problem, right? Which convincing the biggest leveraged, um, you know, dApps to work with you. Or you could work with like one Web2 company that might have like 10 million users and all of a sudden um, you might be the biggest wallet right right away. So uh, I think it's a combination of those two right now. 
Very cool. We're getting close to being time on this episode. So I think we understand what your journey has been to this point and how your startup is different from what's out there in the market. But how do you guys make money? What's your business model? And are there any traction metrics that you're comfortable sharing to date? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two two approaches, like in the long run, what, what, directionally where we want to go, and then short term, how we make money. Short term, how we make money is uh, purely transactions. So because we don't charge developers, uh, we do charge end users. So with, with their, um, whenever they're transacting for a fiat on rent, right? So NFT checkout is a, is a perfect example. Uh, right now we charge 3.9% uh, plus uh, 50 cents. Um, and so, you know, that comes directly from the end users. In the long run, the way we think about this is, um, the, even though our whole hypothesis was that dApps will be what would onboard um, crypto users, not exchanges and not device, but rather just everyday products that people would love to use. The commonality with blockchain um, products, uh, in our opinion, is that because it's on blockchain and not on like Web2, um, there's probably going to be tokenomics involved in which by using this, you're going to earn something interesting. Maybe it's like a security token or maybe it's NFTs. You will want to do something with it outside of that application at some point. Maybe you want to trade it, you want to sell it, off-ramp it, maybe you want to display it. Um, so at some point, I think in order to fully experience Web3, you're going to need your own wallet interface. Like you're going to have to leave that game or the thing that you were playing with um, and go like use use these assets that you've acquired. Um, we're hoping that when, when the time comes, users don't look for MetaMask to like send their tokens that they've earned or export priority uh, key or rather use Ramp or Wallet in itself. Uh, because once we have that eyeball and attention, uh, even though wallets today have not shown that they can monetize, I think, you know, theoretically, um, there's a lot of things you can do when you have a lot of impressions, right? Which become, because web, uh, a wallet could uh, become like a portal in which there's different ways you can monetize those eyeballs. And so um, directionally, that's how we were thinking about it, which is, this is why we're gonna give this away for developers for free. We don't think monetizing this as a direct SaaS model is actually a large business. Um, in fact, just giving it away for completely free, um, because our direct competitors do charge money for their usage. Uh, but for us, like, I, I think if it, if we do it right, uh, and dApps do grow up, uh, or, and get large user base, um, these users will need a wallet. And as long as we can make a seamless experience for them to then just start using our own interface, that's probably where there's more monetization upsides than anything else. Uh, but again, uh, it's, it's theory. Right now, we have less, like about 20,000 end users, uh, daily active like wallet users that's engaging with our wallets, so wow. signing transactions and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, we've, we've launched this and gotten out to the public like around May, and so uh, still very volatile. Um, yeah, so there's lots, lots we have to do. That's awesome. I think what you guys are doing is so inspiring. We definitely need an on-ramp for Web2 native users to Web3. And I think unifying that experience is a great way to do that. One other great call out is this kind of developer first wedge. I think that is very novel in building wallets. So really cool that you guys are doing that. I think we're just at time for this first episode. So right before we wrap up, I wanted to give you an opportunity. You've recently raised a 3 million pre-seed. Are you guys hiring or is there anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, I mean, we're always looking for more partners. So if there are that builders out there, uh, we would love to work with them. Yeah. Awesome. And if our audience wants to connect with you personally, where would be a good place to follow you? Yeah, just, you know, if you go to our homepage at rapper.xyz, uh, all the way at the bottom, there's links to our Discord, Telegram, Twitter. So any of those handles, um, you know, I'll, I'll manage. So it's it's myself or our co-founder that will, that will respond. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think that's it. That's today's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening. CSUN, it was a pleasure to have you on the pod. You did a phenomenal job articulating everything. Everyone will see CSUN again for episode number two, where we discuss strategies, tactics, and hacks that he used to build his business. All right. And that wraps up today's episode. We really hope you enjoyed it. Now, just before I let you go, I wanted to reiterate one thing. We're trying to build the best podcast out there for aspiring entrepreneurs. And to do that, we need your help. The best way you can help us is by joining our Discord community. The link is in the description below. And then leaving us feedback. Tell us how we did. Tell us how we can improve. We're eagerly waiting to hear from you. Other than that, show us some love and follow us on Twitter at The Breakouts Pod. And I think that's everything I have for you. We'll see you next time on The Breakouts.